So now I've got my model, I've got my formula that u over e times p minus z, and now I'm going to turn the information that's in the unemployment and vacancies data. And the question, uh, uh, our question on the table is, why aren't firms creating jobs given what appears to be the large benefits, extra benefits of job creation relative to December 07? Now the standard explanation is that demand is insufficient. And what this means is that the firms believe that they can't sell more than their current production. There's no reason to hire a worker if that worker is going to be producing goods for you that you can't go out and sell to any consumers. And so they don't hire more workers. But implicit in these explanations, the heart of these explanations, is something about prices. The firms can't or won't cut prices to generate more demand. Insufficient demand means the prices aren't adjusting effectively for some reason. So this is what, when I talk about nominal rigidities, it's exactly this explanation, this notion that, I'm, uh, uh, that, that monetary economists and my, myself are capturing. Nominal rigidities are generating low output and high unemployment. And in this case, if this is the explanation for the lack of job creation, lack of demand, then in this case, the natural rate of unemployment is much lower than the unemployment rate. But there are other sources of low job creation buried in the Diamond Morton Sapisaridis model. And it suggests other possible explanations for low job creation. So let's go back to the formula. We had our U of E term, and I've told you that rose, unemployment to vacancies rose by two and a half times. But there are other terms in this formula. And the question is, how did they change over the last three years? In particular, why might after-tax productivity have changed in the last three years? Now, I'm going to emphasize here, I'm going to be talking about taxes. I'm not talking about taxes uh, uh, that uh, changes in taxes that we've actually seen. What I'm talking about is expected increases in taxes. So over the last three years, we've seen large increases in the federal debt. We've seen a large increase in the federal deficit. We, uh, 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 as we heard mentioned already this morning, a lot of states are facing uh, budgetary challenges. There's reasons firms might be worried, they might expect that these budgetary challenges might be met in some fashion by tax increases. Now these tax increases, and one thing that's important to keep in mind, that uh, taxes of a variety of kinds affect the after-tax productivity available to firms and workers. Most obviously, if you tax corporate income, the firm is able to take home, the owners of the firm are able to take home less of the productivity generated by a worker, and that is essentially a shrinkage then in the productivity that's being generated by that worker for the firm, or for the worker, it's going off to the government. As well, personal income taxes. The, the, the share that the worker takes home in this case is being taxed uh, um, in, in, by personal income. And in that case, again, there's less for the worker and the firm to share with one another. Finally, if you even increases in sales taxes influence this, because that affects how much of the productivity is um, actually getting to the consumer. So all these forms of taxes, federal, state, corporate, personal, and sales, end up affecting after-tax productivity. The other uh, possible uh, change that firms might be worried about is expected increases in input prices, like energy. If you think about when you hire a worker, you have to use a certain amount of electricity for that worker to be effective, and that electricity or energy is going up in price, that could also be a, a reason why you think of that worker uh, after-tax productivity is actually being lower. Now what about changes in Z, the benefits of not working? Why might that have risen uh, since in the last three years? Well, there have been extensions in, the, in unemployment insurance benefits. And that is one reason why you might think that it's, it's, uh, the benefits of not working have, have risen in the last three years. So these are, are tentative numbers. And they're, they're, they're to illustrate, only to illustrate the point that there's a lot of uncertainty left once we, about the natural rate of unemployment when we look at the unemployment vacancy data. 
So Dale Mortensen and Ava Najapal, so Dale Mortensen is the same Mortensen that I mentioned earlier, still very active researcher uh, that I mentioned earlier, having won the Nobel Prize. Uh, they have a paper where they set P equal to 1 and Z equal to 0.73. The question is, suppose in the last three years we'd had a 10% fall in P and a 0.05 increase in Z. These are very large, but not entirely implausible changes in these, in these, in these um, values in the, uh, for, 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 for firms and for workers. So if P and Z were to change like this, a 10% fall in P, a 0.05 increase in Z, what happens to the benefits from job creation? Well, I told you U over V going up by two and a half times. If P and Z change the way I described, it go, P minus Z goes from 0.27 down to 0.12. And this increases by only 11%. The product of two and a half times P minus, oh, excuse me, of U, the, uh, U over V, the unemployment vacancy ratio, times P minus Z now rises by only 11% because the fall in P minus Z offsets the increase in the unemployment vacancy rate to that extent. In this scenario, where we have this big change in P and Z, nominal rigidities are much less significant. And U star, the natural rate of unemployment, is not much lower than the unemployment rate. So this is the, this is, this is the summary of what we get to from this. The unemployment vacancy rate has gone up two and a half times. That's in the data since December 07. And by itself, this increase suggests that nominal rigidities are constraining job creation. And the natural rate of unemployment, then, is well below the observed unemployment rate. But it is possible that productivity has fallen and that the, the flow benefits to workers of not working have risen. If these changes are as large as I described, then the job creation benefits are not up by two and a half times, not up by 150%. They're up instead by only 11%. And then nominal rigidities are not constraining job creation much, and the natural rate of unemployment would be nearly as high as the unemployment rate. <coughs> the, the bottom line from this is that the aggregate unemployment vacancies data, even viewed through the lens of this uh, very tight framework, are inconclusive about what the natural rate of unemployment is. And these data alone, just looking at unemployment and vacancies alone, what cannot tell you what the appropriate level of monetary policy accommodation is. Now, one thing that uh, I've left out, one factor I've left out it, it, that has received a lot of attention um, over the, over the uh, past year especially, is there is another factor that could increase the natural rate of unemployment. And that is what's called labor market matching efficiency. If labor market matching efficiency fell, then the natural rate of unemployment would rise. Now, what do I mean by labor market matching efficiency? It's a long technical phrase. What this means is that the firm's probability of finding a qualified applicant is actually lower than would be implied by the high value of unemployment that we see out there in the data. So there's a lot of unemployed relative to the number of job openings. It's gone up by two and a half times. We know that. And when that means that the probability of finding a qualified applicant should go up. But it seems when you look at the data that that has not gone up by as much as you would think, given how much uh, the unemployment to vacancy rate has, 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 has increased. And I, I, I say when you look at the data, what I really mean is if you take the Diamond Mortensen Pissarides model and apply it to this data, I'm not going to go through the details of this, but it does provide an estimate of the post-2007 fall in labor market matching efficiency. It seems like vacancies are not attracting qualified applicants as fast, as easily as you would think, given how many unemployed uh, people there are relative to the, to the job openings. But even when you add this estimate, you might think this estimate might tighten things up a, a little bit on, on what the natural rate of unemployment is. But it turns out the, the range of the natural rate is very high. And here's the, the range. If you think that P minus Z hasn't changed at all, the natural rate might be as low as 5.9%. Slightly higher than the 5% we had in, in 2007. Or the natural rate might be as high as 8.9% if you think that 
after tax productivity has fallen by 0.15, or P minus D has fallen by 0.15. So those are the two scenarios. The one where not much has happened with P minus Z, and then U star is, is low, 5.9%, or the scenario where you think P minus Z has fallen by as much as I described, and then it might be as high as, say, 0.9%.